Alyssa Forstner, and my pronouns are she, her. I work for Student Academic Success Services, and I'll be moderating the session today. If you have questions at any point, um, please message me in the chat. And I'm joining you today from my home in Kingston, which is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. And when I woke up this morning and looked out the window, I was surprised to see that the first snowfall last night actually stayed. And it prompted me to reflect on the changing seasons. Um, I, I'm so grateful to live in a place that has such natural diversity. And I really appreciate the way the natural landscape changes throughout the year. It adapts and morphs and represents itself according to its needs of the season. And um, coming into today's session, I think we can make some comparisons with our own identities. We too change and adapt over time and present multiple facets of our own identities, depending on our context and what we need at that time. And finding these parallels between, you know, myself, my identity and nature helps me more, um, helps me feel more rather connected to the, the land that I am on. So I encourage you to reflect on your own identities and, and how maybe you're connected to the land where you find yourself. Now we are recording today's session, so I'll ask that you please keep your mics turned off unless Lindsay invites you to participate or do otherwise. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen and pass things over to Lindsay. Great, thank you so much. Uh, before I get started with even sharing my presentation, I'd like to begin with the Ahondo Garwadekwa, which translates to the words before all else. These are the words that we speak um, to bring our minds together in a space of gratitude and good energy in this space before we begin our time together. Ohondo garwadekwa, gajokwa sewarohonsio skatni gariwesa, ono gari nuwane deati nuorado njina hodo wasongwawi ne sungwaetiso, deati nuorado ne ongwe suwa, deati nuorado ne yatitni soha jio humyage, deati nuorado ne gatne garunyu, deati nuorado ne ganjo suwa, Dietinuradonsne De chide wa nu radon sne, and chide wa chia joke neka grakwa. De atinu radon sne, yeti sota asota neka grakwa. De atinu radon sne, yoji stokurun jitkara yage. De chide wa nu radon sne, sungwa diso. Tokade ne donhage ne ngwani gora. Tok ni gwanage. So those are the words that, um, uh, bring our minds together in each, each stanza or each part of that um, is giving thanks to a different part of creation. So we start at the beginning by, by opening up and saying that we're giving thanks to all aspects of creation and all the gifts that creator has given us to live a good life together. And then it moves to the people. Uh, we start by giving thanks to the people first, not because they're the most important, but we recognize the, us as the least important part of creation because we rely on all other elements to support our lives. Um, and then it moves into starts at the ground level and goes thanks to the grasses and insects and things on the earth and then moves up and waters and fishes and then moves up into the trees and plant life and and um, eventually moves into um, animals and the winged ones so birds and all those and then moves into um, the sky and giving thanks to to everything that exists in the sky the moon the sun all those elements that sustain us and support us. So, and it's a really great way to ground us and, and remind us to be thankful for those things. Um, so with that, I'll get started with sharing my screen. Um, okay, here we go. Let me know if you can see this okay. I'll put it to full screen. You can see that okay? We can see that, that's great. Great, thank you. Um, so this is the, I've included a link here as well to the, the Mohawk and English translation, because I know if you're using the closed captioning, it will not capture <laughs> the language. Um, so that's there for your reference later. Um, 
I'll start by introducing myself. So, Sego Sego Gagon Wakwa Nurado. So, hello everyone, greetings. Lindsay Denon Gowana Hawi Yungets, Brant De Waxanazre, Gandeke Nida Wagueno, Ganyan Gehaga, Niwax Unjodo, Waganyato. So, what I've said is my first name is Lindsay, and my Mohawk name is Gowana Hawi, which means she carries the words. Uh, my last name is Brant. And then I'm from Gundege, which is the place name for Tainanaga Mohawk Territory. And it, it translates to on the bay because um, Tainanaga is located along the shoreline of the Bay of Quinte. Um, and you'll see in the pictures here, I've included some, some shots of uh, along the Bay of Quinte, um, some sunsets that I, I love to capture um, here. And so this is where I grew up and this is where I'm currently living. Um, and then I've also said that I'm a part of the Mohawk Nation. Um, and then I also ended with my clan. So I sit with the turtle clan here in Tandanega. And all of this is, is um, this short introduction can be extended into many things and many ideas come from this. So the remainder of this presentation will really focus on um, every single part of that introduction and what it means and, and giving you further details on all of that. So the story behind my name, I'll start there. Uh, Gabona Howie is my Mohawk name, which as I said, means she carries the words. Um, I was given the name in consultation with my Mohawk language teacher, uh, Gary Wahoe at the time. Uh, we were thinking about my personality traits, interests and the time of year that I was born. I was born in May. Um, so generally you would have a name that reflects like the time of year that you were born. Uh, she carries the words, I think of springtime being a time when, when the winds are, are visiting again and the warm air is starting to come in for summer. Um, and also the name is important to me because I am a writer and a, a poet and a storyteller and words have always been special to me. So I really um, appreciate this name. And, and I think when my Mohawk language teacher gave it to me, she also wanted it to be um, inspirational for my future because she recognized that I had a love for our Mohawk language and a, <clears throat> and a gift for learning it. Um, so I've been trying to pick that back up and continue on with my language learning um, right now as well. Um, so generally though, Haudenosaunee naming ceremonies are done in Longhouse. So traditionally uh, the babies would be named during uh, the Longhouse um, naming ceremonies. Um, so uh, that is that practice is coming back into into place here in Tainanaga, we do have a longhouse that was established here. And there are those that go to longhouse and practice the tradition still and the naming ceremony does take place here too. Um, but previously before having a longhouse in Tainanaga, we would have had to go to other communities to participate in their longhouses. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about the story of the place. So Gundeke, as I said, translates to on the bay and it's the place name for Tindanega Mohawk territory. The name of Tindanega is interesting too and, and came from uh, the, name, the Mohawk name of Joseph Brandt. His, name, his Mohawk name was Tindanega and you'll see variations on the spelling of that, but that's where that came from as well. Um, so our ancestral homeland is actually uh, in the Mohawk River Valley, which is present day New York state. Um, and the Mohawks are considered the easternmost nation within the Iroquois Six Nation Confederacy. You'll also hear the term Haudenosaunee, and that um, just means the Six Nations. Um, so the Mohawks are considered the keepers of the Eastern Door. The original Five Nation Confederacy was made, out of, made up of Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca Nations. Uh, the Tuscaroras later joined and around 1722 is when, when they were adopted into the Confederacy, making it Six Nations. Um, the Mohawks were British allies in the American Revolution. Um, and so at that time, it's, it, that's around the time when we became um, kind of, uh, uh, there was a necessity to move from our homelands in New York State to um, where we now reside in, in, on the, along the Bay of Quinte. So um, in um, compensation for the loss of homelands and in recognition of their faithful military alliance with the British Crown, the Six Nations were um, to select any of the unsettled lands in Upper Canada. So as a result of that, um, 
my ancestors selected the lands on the North shore of Lake Ontario for settlement. And so these lands um, became a part of, of the Iroquois um, homelands and were, um, they were previously controlled um, by us in prior to the Royal Proclamation. So it wasn't new land, but it was definitely a movement that took place because we were coming from New York state. Um, so the Bay of Quinty is also the birthplace of the peacemaker. And the peacemaker is um, the one who brought the original five nations together um, to form the constitution of peace in the 12th century and also form the Confederacy. Um, so our ancestors traveled by canoe from, from the Quebec area and arrived on the shorelines of the Bay of Quinty around May 20, on May 22nd, 1784. So at the time it was about 20 families or approximately 100 to 125 people. And they were met by the Mississaugas who lived in the area as well. Um, so annually here in Tindanaga, we do it, we mark the anniversary of this landing with a reenactment of the landfall. So paddling of the canoes, people will, will get into the canoes and, and uh, reenact that, that landing on the shorelines. Um, and that's done with uh, the opening words that I shared this morning, a, and, uh, and dignitaries will come, like the chief will be there from Tandanega. Many others will come and celebrate uh, with us in those times. The last two years, because of COVID, it's been done uh, more virtually with videos describing the history and, and that experience. But um, if you ever get a chance to come one May, um, it's a great thing to watch and, and be a part of. So I'll talk a little bit more too about the, the peacemaker. So the peacemaker, um, as I mentioned, was um, helped to form the, the Five Nations Confederacy at the time in the 12th century. And he also established something called the Great Law of Peace. And the Great Law of Peace really focuses on um, three main values. So uh, strength, peace, and a good mind. So those are all intertwined in that, in that message of peace and kind of formed our political structure and our social structures and just our worldview and the way that we interact with each other as well. Um, so Eagle Hill, which is located in Tanjanega, is said to be where the, the peacemaker was born. Um, so to symbolize the great peace and the unity of the Confederacy, the peacemaker chose a white pine, uh, one that was tall with long branches that would cover the nations of the Confederacy and with long roots that would reach out to other nations that would hear the law, laws of the great peace and want to follow them as well. So it was a way to welcome other nations into joining in that um, peace agreement. And also underneath the tree, you would see uh, a weapons of war would be buried there. So never again would nations take up battle against each other. And on top of the tree uh, sat an eagle. So the eagle would act as a guardian to the great peace and watch for any threats or anything that would come to threaten that peace that the people had established. So this great law of peace really brought together the five nations, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca, and it encouraged them to end their years of warring and form the, the Confederacy. So it, it provides all kinds of guidelines and it's a very um, long document. Um, and it, it really highlights and, and sets out political, social, and spiritual order of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and its peoples. There's a lot of content in the, the full version of the, the Great Law of Peace report. I think you can find still find versions of it online as well. Um, but it really outlines the roles of the chiefs, the roles of clan mothers and all of those um, political things within and spiritual things within the Longhouse community and within the nation. Um, so it's a great thing to look at. And actually, um, there's a lot of thought that um, a lot of the American constitution was modeled after this, this um, great law of peace and that the Americans really look to this kind of form of democracy to formulate their own, their own political structures too. So this is an image of the, um, the Confederacy. So you'll see the Mohawk um, nation is on, on the uh, Eastern side because we're the keepers of the Eastern door. And then the Oneida um, and the Cayuga are kind of on either side of the central, the Onondaga are the central fire, they're the fire keepers. The Oneida and the Cayuga are almost considered like the babies of the, of the family because they're um, on either side. And then um, the Seneca are keepers of the Western door. So there's, there's roles for every single nation within this. And it's all kind of laid out in that, that great law of peace and the structure of the Confederacy as well.
Okay. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our treaty and our lands. So although the Crown had promised the lands to the Six Nations the year before, our ancestors had found when they arrived that some of the lands had been occupied by Loyalist families. So after nine years of reminding the Crown of promises made at the close of the war, the Six Nations were granted a tract, tract of land, although smaller than originally promised. The land came to be known as the Mohawk Tract, and it was about the size of a township, approximately 92,700 acres on the Bay of Quinte. And a deed to this land known as the Simcoe Deed or Treaty Three and a Half was executed on April 1st, 1793. And that's by uh, Lieutenant Governor John Brave Simcoe. Um, so not long after the Mohawks made settlement, many United Empire Loyalists continued to come to the Bay of Quinte area. And within a span of 23 years from 1820 to 1843, two thirds of the treaty land base under the Simcoe deed was lost as the government made provisions to accommodate settler families. Today, the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinte have approximately 18,000 acres remaining of the original treaty land base and the current membership numbers are over 8,000 for our community. So you'll see that the land mass uh, and base dwindled quite, quite a bit over time. We've been recently in negotiations to get sections of that back. Um, one recent land negotiation and land claim process that we won partially was the Culbertson track, uh, land claim. And it was, uh, it's supposed to be a return of about 600 acres we got 300 back um, just recently, a few weeks ago, that was announced that we received that back as well as compensation for the loss of that land. Um, and we're still working. That took about 19, at least 19 years um, to work towards. And then we're still working towards the remainder of that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the flag of Tyndanaga Mohawk territory as well. So the colors are derived from the, the colors used in the wampum belts. And I'll talk a little bit more about wampum belts in a little bit as well. Um, the white is the emblem of something good of peace and purity. And then the purple is emblem of more important affairs of a civic nature. The eagle um, in the center, Ogwex is the Mohawk word for eagle. Um, because of his ability to see far, the peacemaker placed him at the top of the great tree of peace. And he was, as I mentioned, a guardian to look out for any danger or threaten anything that would threaten the peace. Um, and he would warn the Haudenosaunee people or the people of the Confederacy about that, any dangers that would be approaching. The silver chain. So a covenant which represents the relationship between the Haudenosaunee, which uh, the Mohawk nation is a member and the Europeans. So at the time, um, it was the Dutch that most agreements were made with, um, but this relationship was to be pure, strong, and untarnished as the silver of a chain. The tradition behind the silver chain is important as it recognizes a need or a continue to pay continuous attention to polish the chain and keep it in healthy condition. So together, these symbolize the need for continuous dialogue between the Mohawk Nation and other governments to maintain the health of our relationship and deal with current issues. So it's really setting out that, that relationship between that nation to nation relationship. And the circle symbolizes the great peace and the great law, the Guyana Ga Goa, um, that was established by the five nations of the Haudenosaunee. And so it would be said that the, the chief, Five Nations League Chiefs would stand joined hands in circle um, around the tree of peace so that if a tree should fall upon your joined hands, it wouldn't separate or weaken your hold and the strength of the union and that the strength of that peace would be upheld. So the story of the nation, the Mohawk Nation or Ganyongehaga, um, Mohawks are known as the people of the Flint. So that's really what Ganyongehaga means. And also, um, as I mentioned, the Mohawks are considered the easternmost nation within the Iroquois Six Nation Confederacy and referred to as the keepers of the Eastern Door. Um, so today the Ganyongehaga inhabit eight communities in what is known as Ontario, Quebec, and New York. So we have the Wata in the Muskoka Lakes region of Georgian Bay, north of Toronto, Oshwegan on the Grand River near Hamilton, Tindanaga on the Bay of Quinte near Belleville, and then um, the Gunyonge is west, west of Plattsburgh, New York. Um, Gunajo Harege on the Mohawk River, that's our ancestral homelands um, that I mentioned. And then Aquasasne on the St. Lawrence River, which straddles the US and Canadian border near Cornwall, Ontario, and Mass 
and New York as well. And then the Ganasadage uh, on the Lake of Two Mountains, west of Montreal, Quebec, and Ganawage is on the St. Lawrence River, south of Montreal, Quebec. Nation to nation relations. So more about, about the um, wampum, the story of the two row wampum is an important one as well because it represents the basis of the agreements between the Haudenosaunee nations and other nations of people. It's regarded as a, uh, an important covenant that sets the framework for future agreements. The wampum belt represents the relationships between two nations based on the principles of peace, friendship and mutual respect. So the two row wampum belt was made with two parallel row, row, rows of purple wampum on a bed of white beads. So you'll see the um, between the rows of purple beads are three rows of white beads. And those white beads are meant to represent or symbolize the purity of the agreement. And some say that it also represents the river of life. These were made to stand for friendship, peace and respect between the two nations. So as much as the two rows keep the nation separate, it also binds them together. And some say that those two rows of purple beads represent two vessels. So one could be a canoe and one could be a ship and represents them traveling parallel to each other down the river of life, side by side and incorporated in the agreement. But neither nation will try to steer the vessel of the other or interfere or impede with the travel of the other. So some say it represents the spirits of Haudenosaunee and non-Haudenosaunee people, past, present, and future. Um, and you can see in the background here is a picture of the wampum. It would have been made with wampum um, shells and, and beads, and that would be the, the structure of it. And um, you can see various images available of it on, online as well. So now I'll talk a little bit about the story of the clans. So the clan system, Haudenosaunee clan system was created by the peacemaker and introduced a system with nine clans. So turtle, bear, wolf, hero, um, heron, hawk, snipe, beaver, deer, and eel. Um, so those would be found across the Confederacy. Um, so this would be so that uh, members of clans could develop those familial ties regardless of which nation they are from. So clans within the Mohawk Nation at Tainanega, we have bear, turtle, and wolf here. Um, and then among the Haudenosaunee, our groups of people who come together as families called clans. It's a matrilineal society. So each clan is linked by a common female ancestor with women um, possessing a leadership role within the clan. Uh, the number of clan varies among nations. As I mentioned, Mohawk having three, and then Oneida can have as many as nine. Uh, the clans are represented by birds and animals, which are um, divided into three elements of water, land, and air. The bear and wolf and deer represent the land element, the turtle, eel, and beaver represent water element, and the snipe, hawk, and heron represent the air element. Um, so each member of a clan is considered a relative regardless of which nation they belong to. So for example, a wolf clan member of the Mohawk and a wolf clan member of the Seneca Nation are still considered relatives. Family names and clans are passed down from mother to child. For example, if a man belongs to the turtle clan were to marry a woman from the wolf clan, the children would become wolf clan. And then within certain clans, there are maybe different types of an one animal or bird. So there could be a variety of turtles, wolves, or bears. Um, there wasn't allowed intermarriage within a clan. So you had to make sure that you're marrying someone outside of your clan. Um, and the, the current day situation with uh, in Tainanega is that there's a lot of mixed marriages and people that have married outside of, of Mohawk even. So for example, my clan um, comes from my grandmother because my mom is, is not Mohawk. She's European and uh, Algonquin mix and she didn't grow up here. But um, so it goes to, in Tainanega, we do it so that it goes to the next female. So it would be my grandmother's clan is Turtle Clan. And that's why for now, I would sit with the turtles. Um, I would sit with the turtles in Longhouse and my two boys would as well. And then we would be observed for a period of probably about a year or so. And then if our personality and the way that we contribute in Longhouse matches still with the turtle, then we remain turtle. But there is potential that we could join, be asked to join another clan by that clan. Um, but for the most part, you sit with the, with the turtle until that's determined. So I thought, um, I think so much 
there's so much to unpack, even in just that introduction that I gave of myself at the beginning. I could probably go on and on for, for a long time about all the history behind that and, and the meaning that can be um, drawn from it. But I wanted to, to highlight this the importance of like, what's your story and the questions that, that that can bring. So what's your story? Who are you? Who are your people? Where do you come from? How do you connect with your identity? And are you a good relative? I think these are questions that I ask myself for sure um, when I think about my own identity. And it's not uncommon for other Indigenous peoples to ask this of each other too. Um, we, wanted, we want to know um, who, who each other are, who your family is. So we'll often ask, like, who are your parents? Who are your grandparents? Where do you come from? And, and how do you connect? And, and those types of things. And it's not an interrogation. It's just truly because we want to know and we want to understand and we want to see if there's a connection. Um, so I think uh, there's many ways to think about what it means to be a good relative too. And I think when I talked about the words before else, all else in the beginning, I really think about self in relation and, and the fact that we're connected to each other as humans, but we're also connected to all aspects of creation, animals, plant life, the earth itself, and how much those um, beings influence our identity as well. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention in the beginning, but um, an elder that I, is very close to me and, and dear to my heart, she said that when you introduce yourself, you're not just stating to those in the room, you're also introducing yourself to all of creation and you're introducing yourself to creator so that he knows who's speaking and who's, um, whose words he is hearing. Um, so when you keep that in mind, it really, um, changes the way you you think about things and your worldview shifts because from the moment you you speak you recognize that you're in connection you're in relationship with everything around you and it really shifts the way that you speak and I think encourages you to speak speak well use good words and really think about the energy that those words hold and what they can mean for those beyond the context of where you are even beyond the human level too. So with that, I, I think I'll stop sharing and I have a, a Padlet that I've created that I'd love for us to contribute to. It's a map and you can pinpoint your location. You can type in the name of the place, either where you're from now or where your, your homeland is. And we can explore it together in that way. And then I'm also um, open for questions if anyone has questions. So I'll stop sharing and then I'll put the link in the chat. Thank you so much, Lindsay. There were a few questions that came in the chat during your presentation. So I don't know if you want to address those first while folks are playing around in that Padlet or, or how you want to navigate that. Um, let me know if you need any help finding those questions. I can scroll up and read them to you. Okay, sure. If you wouldn't mind reading, I can answer those. And if you want to go into the Padlet and begin putting your name and, and location in there, you can do that as well. Uh, so the first question that came in was, um, it, it was when you were describing how you got your name and how it came from your Mohawk teacher. And the question was whether um, this is common practice to do most folks get their name later in life? Is that something that, you know, a decision that they're involved in or do some people get their names at birth? So if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, so I think traditionally, definitely it would have been done in the naming ceremonies in Longhouse, but because um, of colonization, uh, many of our traditions were so fractured and we're just now revitalizing and bringing those back. Um, so it's not uncommon to get your name later in life, um, or some parents are even naming um, a Mohawk name from birth too, on their own with consultation of elders and community members. Um, but the important part is to just... Um, look to the local communities protocols to see around what, what the naming um, policy is. I know different communities approach it in different ways, even different Mohawk communities, there's differences amongst them. So um, it's really, it's really uh, it varies. So some may receive their, their name in Longhouse as babies, some may receive in Longhouse later in life or um, through maybe untraditional means like I did um, through consultation with a, an elder. Wow, that, that's uh, so interesting. Um, this this wasn't a question from from one of our audience, but I have a follow up question to that. Um, you know, you mentioned the, your mother's identity and and background, and so I'm wondering if um, 
if non-Indigenous folks marry into an Indigenous family, are they also invited to receive a, a name or is that reserved for um, only uh, Indigenous folks? If, I hope that question makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. And that's also a bit complicated, but I think um, if you're a member, of, you're married into the community, you're considered a member of the community and you can participate in Longhouse and things like that. But um, it depends on the community around the naming, the naming ceremonies and the conventions there. Um, and also it's very complicated in terms of membership and identity because of things like the Indian Act. So for example, when my parents married, it was prior to 1985. And so at the time, um, because my dad is Mohawk and my mom's not, she actually gained status as a Mohawk, a member of the Mohawks of the Bay of Puni, and they, that was because it was prior to 1985. After that, they stopped that. And prior to 1985, if a, a Mohawk woman married out, she would lose her status. And so there's a lot of complexity in terms of who's a member and who's not. And, and that can come, comes into the mix sometimes when it comes to time to do traditions like naming and, and participation in the community. But um, we've been a fairly open community here in Tidenega, allowing a lot of participation of families that have, have kind of um, have mixed marriages or, or different um, backgrounds can join too, so. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, um, another question that was asked in the chat was um, whether the, the peace treaty was uh, written in a language that was understood throughout the, the Confederation. So recognizing that linguistic diversity um, and, and I think the question was around, is there a common language and what might that be? Yeah, so that's interesting because yes, there there are many different um, languages. Uh, the Six Nations each have their own um, language that would be uh, unique to them. Um, even there's dialectical differences between Mohawk communities too that you'll see. But what happens with the the Great Law? And I don't know back like historically what happened, but I know it was very. It's an oral tradition too. So the there's a recitation of the great law that happens every couple of years and it moves to different communities. So different communities will host that, that reading. And if they have the speakers, they will do it in their language and then in English as well. But um, so I think that movement and that, that um, oral tradition of keeping it alive that way was a way that they could, they could um, share that message across the, the languages. I love that. It's amazing. Thank you. Um, so knowledgeable. The, the next question is about the, the matrilineal status. Um, so are all First Nations uh, matriarchal in structure or is that just the Mohawk nation? Yeah, um, all of the ones within the Haudenosaunee Confederacy would be. And I think there's other, other nations that follow that as well. I'm not sure I can't really speak um, with great depth of knowledge about other other nations, but I know um, some fall that some are more patrilineal. But it really depends on the on the location and and the history behind that too. Of course. Uh, okay. And last question we have here actually comes from me again. Um, uh, so you, you talked about. Um, being part of Turtle Clan, but how there's this potential to uh, switch clans and that depending on, um, you know, you, you might spend a year within a clan and, and if it's not the right fit, um, it might be recommended that you, you move to another clan. And so I was just wondering, is, is that a decision that would be made by the collective, by the community? Um, is it a request or is it a, is it a demand? Um, is that something that would come down from elders or be done in consultation with the people being asked to move? Uh, uh, so if, uh, I, I'm just wondering if you could speak a bit more to that. Yeah, so that's specific to people that aren't necessarily don't receive their clan directly from their mother. So like in my case, I, as I mentioned, my mom isn't Mohawk, so it would go to my grandmother. And that's more of a way of just situating to make sure it's a good fit for me still to be within the turtle. And that would be decided collectively with those that attend Longhouse. So if I attend Longhouse with my two boys, we would be observed by those people directly in there. And then they would they would make a, a kind of statement um, any of the other clans that might want to claim us would make a statement and, and ask that we join their clan. It, and that's kind of rare. Like it's, it's likely more likely that we would remain turtle, but it's, it's more rare that we would be asked to join another, another um, clan. Excellent. So I think that was all of the questions in the chat. Um, 
And so maybe I'll pass the mic back to you unless, are, are there any other questions um, at this time? No, I'm sorry about that. I, I missed all your answers, but I, I will find out them. <laughs> <laughs> I had my old Zoom freezing moment again, which Lindsay knows all about from uh, I, IRDC day. <laughs> so, I, okay. so are we, are we going to go to this Padlet thing? Because I found, how do you stick something, how do you put a pin in it? Yeah, so it should be a little um, plus symbol at the top right corner. If you click that, it'll allow you to type in and or search by place name. Um, so you can do, you should be able to do that from that link that I provided. Okay, because I, I was able to sort of shrink it so I can see a world map, which was good. Sorry, I'm not as good as you guys. <laughs> Okay, how do I do this? How do I pin? I'm not seeing the, the plus sign, Lindsay. Do, is it possible that we have to be logged in? Um, it shouldn't it shouldn't require you to be logged in. I'm not sure why it wouldn't. Let me just see check the settings on it to make sure that okay. it's set for sharing. I think it is. I'm just pleased it wasn't just me. Because you know me and technology, not <laughs> the best. It looks like to me that it's everything should be set so that you can contribute. I'll put the link again just in case any permissions have updated. Oh, okay. So it's best if we go out and come back in. Yeah. Try okay. The most recent link that I posted. No worries. Thank you. Okay. And then. Okay. One of these little things down here say, oh, that's the post. Maybe I can try sharing my screen just to show what it looks like for me. Right. Yeah, that might good. That might be good. Um, yeah. Oh, so we that little plus is not there. You're not seeing this pink plus at the corner. No. Oh, okay. No. But maybe favorite. folks could share in the chat and, and uh, you could add it. So this is what it looks like if it was working anyway. And I've just put my own there. I put a uh, member of the Mohawks of the Aquini, Tandanaga Mohawk Territory. And it allows you to pin it on the map. Um, so put in um, with technology not on our side right now. We'll just type in the chat um, if you want to share where you're from originally and kind of a little bit of a story behind that. Or even if you wanted to grab the mic and share if you're comfortable. Happy to speak if that's easier. Yeah. Okay. Might as well be first off the off the rank, as they say. Okay. So uh, um, my name is Colette Steer, and I was actually born in England in a little town called Kidsgrove. In at home, I wasn't born in a hospital. I was born at home, and um, I remember the stories of my my parents saying, "Mum was upstairs giving birth to me, and Dad was downstairs trying to make a Sunday roast um, and keeping my brothers and sisters away." So mum could do what she needed to do and they didn't have a proper um, crib for me. So they cleaned out a, a drawer in the chest of drawers for me to be in, in the beginning. So that's where I was and, that's, and I lived in England for the first 10 years of my life before emigrating with my family to Australia and lived the most of my, the rest of my childhood in Australia before starting to move around a little bit more. My background, for me, my family has always been super, super important, both immediate and extended. Um, that was one of our worries moving to Australia, that we wouldn't have that connection still with our extended family. But we should never have worried because we all love to travel. So we've always had lots of opportunities to, to catch up. The background of my, my family, my father's side, you could say it's a little boring because it really was just the UK. Um, Whereas my mother's side, the ancestry there is from Ireland, from Portugal. And my mother herself was born in what's today called Myanmar, formerly Burma. Um, and so, and you know, on her side, they've had family members who've traveled and lived in Egypt at the beginning of, before, you know, to help set up, for instance, the Egyptian Air Force and things way, way back and um, other ancestors who, who moved to Australia for the gold rush, didn't make their fortune, so came back. Um, 
it's all those bits and pieces. And I guess I've got that travel bug because I love meeting new people. I did spend a few years in uh, New Zealand or Aotearoa where my brother actually still lives and he's been living there for 30 plus years with his partner. Um, and then of course now I'm here in Canada, been here for 16 years now in Canada. So I still, you know, I've been an immigrant in a lot of different countries and uh, been also very fortunate. But um, yeah, family is very super, super important. And we've in, hopefully we've instilled that on our nieces and nephews and great nephews um, to be able to continue that tradition of the importance of family and understanding where you come from. So Lindsay, thank you very much for sharing your story. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Colette. I appreciate that. And I see a few people have shared in the chat as well. So thank you so much for that. I was going to say, I'm, I'm happy to share. So I think one of the things you asked, Lindsay, is, uh, sorry, I'm going to move it because my cam, sorry, I'm looking ahead on my bigger screen. So I'll look at the <laughs> camera is um, just a place that means something. So I'm close to my, I'm closer to my mom's side of the family and my background on my mom's side. And my mom's family um, are Dukabor Russian. And so they uh, largely, um, since the late 1800s are settled in a place called Udashenya, um, which is south of Castlegar in the interior of British Columbia. And um, the Dukabors are uh, part of something called the United Spiritual Communities of Christ. Um, and it was a religion that um, they actually believe that God dwells in, in each person and not in a church. And so they reject a lot of sort of um, structured spiritual faith and secular government um, and uh, pacifism. Um, peace is a foundation of, of the spiritual um, community. And so in the 1800s, when um, Tsar Nicholas II demanded um, that everyone in Russia uh, become part of the Orthodox faith and sort of pledge allegiance, if you will, to the Russian government, they resisted and they resisted uh, the enforced membership in the military and they, they burned the weapons that, that they were given. And as an entire community um, uh, immigrated to North America and as a faith, they also don't believe in individual land ownership. They believe in, that um, the land is part of the community and they lived communally. And they first immigrated to Saskatchewan. Um, and then when the homestead laws of the Canadian government at the time changed, that required individuals to register for tracts of land, which was also, you know, so there's a lot of settler pieces here that I'm really conscious of. and and what's really interesting is they continued to move further west um, as a result of not wanting to participate um, in that ownership um, and to continue to live as a community. So they moved into the central interior of British Columbia at the time and continued to live um, as a faith community and community based and, and not own, own land. Um, and it's very, there's some interesting, interesting similarities from a clan perspective. So you couldn't marry within your community either. And there was several communities and families belong to, different families belong to a different community. And um, when the boys became of a certain age, you were sent out to another community um, um, to marry and to live. And um, even now to actually the Duke of War Cemetery that is in Odeshenia where my grandparents are buried. I unfortunately can't be buried there because my mom married outside of uh, the spiritual community, but my grandparents are married there. And in order to do that, you actually have to apply back to um, the community and, uh, and show that you were part of the original families in one of the communities um, that through that you wanted to um, be a part of. So, so I've learned a lot more from my mom as she's gotten older about that part. And being a girl, I think I tend to just naturally be closer to my mom and my grandma and, um, and that side of my family. And so that part of the country means a lot to me. And it's really interesting to go home and, and connect people with that part of my heritage too. And um, I really do, I can really appreciate sort of, um, even in coming here as settlers, um, their def the, the faith that they had that 
that also just didn't even appreciate or want to be part of the structures that were in place when they they came here. Um, so I think that opens my mind really well to to learning more um, about some of the Indigenous history and and I can feel some of that personally in the sense that just um, not the same, of course, but um, it resonates with me when when I think about it too. So great, thank you for sharing that, Nadia. That's great. Um, a lot of parallels and a lot of interesting connections there too. Um, and thank you to everyone that's sharing in the chat too. I really appreciate it. I think it's so interesting when we share our background and, and go beyond the name or the introduction to include so much history and background and, and interesting um, stories within that too. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes um, left if anyone has any final thoughts or questions. I think there's something I'd like to bring up, Lindsay, is that, and listening from your talking, and I think I've had the benefit now of being at Queen's for 15 years in this role, and I came here thinking I was just going to be an administrator, but I've actually learned so much since I've been here, um, which, is, which is the beauty, I guess, of a, an educational institution. But one of the things that made me think more about as... You know, you talked about your background and, and then asking us about our own background is that, you know, in, I never really thought about my background in, this, in the same way, other than the fact I love my family. And other than the fact I think our family has done a great job of showing kindness wherever we have been and, and not try to um, just bring our own beliefs into wherever we've moved to. We wanted to make sure that we understand where we are. And that's that's certainly what I've done here since moving to Kingston and being in, in Queens of understanding the background of, you know, the fact that we are sitting on Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. And that reminded me when I moved to Sydney for, lived in fifth, uh, Sydney for 15 years, you know, the um, Aboriginal area, that was the Gadigal tribe. And of course, when I brought up, brought up in Canberra, that means meeting place. That's why that name was chosen. Um, even it used to just be farming land, but they chose uh, an, an Indigenous name. And so it's reminded me of a lot of those things, but it also has reminded me, well, first of all, growing up, we didn't learn a lot about what Australian history, either um, Indigenous history or European history within Australia. We, for some reason, they didn't do that. They're doing it, they're changing now. So I'm glad to see that more things are happening to, even here, the fact, you know, your position that you've got here at the CTL and the fact that Queen's is trying to do more to make us have a better understanding of, you know, where we are, where we sit, and what we are a part of. You, you talked about the, you know, how do we fit within that part of the, cre the creator? I still struggle to, to figure out where that is, and I wish I could find it. Um, I'd love to be able to say I'm a member of the Turtle Clan or something like that, but I don't know what I would say because that's that's not part of how I was brought up, and I'm a steer. There you go. Um, <laughs> but I would love to have that better connection with the environment other than loving it, and... and uh, uh, I think that would be really neat. And so hopefully one day I can find those words that you've asked us, you know, where, where do we fit in terms of, or where do we see ourselves as, to, to speak to the creator? Um, brought up a Catholic, definitely not a practicing Catholic. A lot of Catholicism I don't agree with. Um, but to me, if, if I'd say, broaden it to be a Christian, my Christian thing is be kind to everyone as I would like them to be kind to me. So um, I guess, if anything, that's it. And not just to people, to the land, look out of the land, etc. So maybe that is where it comes in. Yeah, yeah. And that's interesting. And I think those questions that I posed at the end are questions that we ask throughout our whole lives. We never stop asking those and the answer at different type times in our life can be different. And I think spirituality, um, a lot of people wonder where that can come in in their own lives. And I think it, that is a journey in itself too. And it can be um found in many ways it can be in our connection to with each other like you said our values our value systems or our values that we base our lives on and the way that we live can um factor in a lot to our spirituality and and really forms a part of who we are and that can change and shift over time as well and 
I think the more we know about ourselves too, the more we can kind of um, step into that, that space where we can explore those things in, in greater depth too. Something I really appreciate about um, the introduction that you've shared and, and the way you've described your identity is how connected it is to the community and the people you interact with and, and the places you interact with actually on a daily basis. And, um, you know, there's, of course, something to be said for, for ancestry and, and a family name, um, but, you know, the, the connections I feel perhaps to folks here in my Kingston community um, with whom I, I share no blood or share no family ties is, is in many ways much stronger and much more impactful on who I am as a person on my identity than some great, 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 great grandfather who I happen to share a name with, but never met and, and don't really know and, and have no connection to. So I think um, I, I, I really appreciate the, uh, the broader approach to um, to identifying yourself. Mm, Susan, I see you have your hand up. Sorry, sorry for the witness protection lighting, honestly. I, <laughs> it's, I'm not in witness protection. I know nothing. Um, I just wanted to say too, like I grew up in a, in a very close knit family that was very much uh, you know, imbued with sort of cultural elements. So it was a Polish background and uh, we were very close with my aunts and uncles on both sides and um, and the older people in the community at Christmas and Easter and, and just, well, on the regular, there were always old men <laughs> who, who weren't part of our family as such, but who would come, you know, to, to be there during um, celebrations and, and would, would just be sort of embraced by the family because they're their relatives would have been in the old country and, and hadn't immigrated when, you know, when they came over. And um, just the idea of community and connection and losing that as you, you know, go out into the world and, and you know, like the language, um, you know, my grandparents, some of them were deceased, but the ones that were still around when I was little, didn't speak English very well, you know, they, they, they spoke very broken English, but everyone spoke Polish still and, and all that being lost, um, you know, making me think about, about, um, that's something that happened. It wasn't imposed. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, um, forced on a people and, and what it feels like to have sort of drifted away from that as opposed to having it ripped from you is, is something that, I haven't thought a lot about, but I miss it. And yeah, bears, bears some pondering in terms of what we're grappling with now and, and what was, you know, as, as an immigrant family to coming to Canada as a, you know, as a land that belonged to whoever came here because it was like, you know, virgin territory and, and never thinking about what, who was being displaced or what that meant and, and whose, whose place was being taken up by folks incentivized to come here and so on is, is very um, troubling and very much worth unpacking, I think, in each of our own stories. That was a bit incoherent, sorry. It's the witness protection thing, for sure. That's great, thank you so much for sharing. Um, yeah, I think when you do explore all the aspects of your identity, you really think about the last part of that, those questions that I highlighted, like self in relation, like how does my identity intersect with those around me and, and how does that, my positionality kind of complicate that or, or um, even um, just collide with that in different ways, right? So um, it's definitely worth investigating and thinking about if you hadn't, haven't given it a lot of thought is to go back and, continually ask those questions and continually explore who am I and how can I be a good relative and what does that mean for me so thank you so much for joining today everyone and thank you so much for the organizing um, committee of this conference for inviting me to speak and open up the day and I hope you're able to attend the sessions for the rest of the week too because they look incredible thanks <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay. This has been an absolutely wonderful session. Um, I know 
I I have a lot that I'm going to reflect on. It's and it's been a beautiful way to open this conference. I do hope that I'll see uh, some of you folks at sessions throughout the week. Uh, everything is accessible online. Um, and if you're a student, don't forget that we have that conference uh, the the conference giveaway uh, tickets to the concert that's happening at the Isabel on Sunday with Sadaf Amini and her Iranian musician trio so that's going to be fantastic and if at any point you have any questions please reach out to me i'm going to put my email in the chat here uh, but it's also on our website um let's see. and then the final thing that i will ask is and i have to get my link again because i copied something else i apologize um but i have a feedback form that i'm going to put in the chat here and this is the first year that we're running this conference and our hope is to continue to be able to celebrate international education week uh, every year in this manner international education week happens every year uh, during the third week of november um, and so if you have any feedback for us on how we could uh, celebrate international education um, more or differently, please let us know. And my colleague Lydia has also put uh, a link in the chat there um, for, for the concert. If you're not a student and, and can't enter our, our ticket giveaway, you can either purchase your own tickets or you can watch the live stream of the concert uh, through the Isabel's website. So it is 11 o'clock on the dot. For those of you who know me, know that I tend to run long. So this is a, a big day. We're ending right on time. And once again, Lindsay, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone uh, for all of your thoughtful contributions. Melissa, Lindsay, awesome start. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.